working on this call. Um, the topic of my talk is um, climate change and changing hydrology. This is obviously a very broad topic and I don't have a lot of time to go into great depth, but um, I thought I'd just review some of the general hydrological trends in, in the Northeastern US, uh, present some current research that's happening on this topic, and then finish with some discussion of implications for uh, water resource management. <laughs> that is strange. I can't seem to forward my. Oh, there we go. Oh, there it's a you little go. slow there. Um, uh, so, as uh, Amanda indicated, my primary research site is the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest in New Hampshire. And so, a lot of the uh, data and studies I'll be presenting are, are from Hubbard Brook. I think uh, it sounds like many of you are familiar with Hubbard Brook um, and, uh, and have heard about it. I know some of you have been there too. Um, it's a, a pretty neat place. Uh, if you ever get an opportunity to visit, uh, please don't come now. Uh, but at some point if, in the future, if you're interested, we'll, uh, we'll greet you there with open arms. Uh, the Experimental Forest is an 8,000 acre uh, research reserve in the White Mountain National Forest. It was established as a center for hydrologic research in, in the Northeast in, in 1955. And at that time, there was a lot of concern about forest harvesting and impacts on flooding, erosion, and, and water supply. And so a lot of the early work at Hubbard Brook focused on that. Since that time, the research program has really expanded and there's people um, from all over doing all, all sorts of, of ecological research at, at the site. Um, one of the things that really put Hubbard Brook on the map is that uh, it's got one of the um, oldest and, and longest records of precipitation and streamwater um, chemistry any, anywhere in the world, really. Um, and, and that record provided some of the first evidence of acid rain in, in North America. Um, and, and also a lot of insight on nutrient cycling in general. The experimental forest is six miles long by three miles wide. It's named after Hubbard Brook, which is the main uh, drainage in the experimental forest that runs through the middle of it here. And, and the boundary of the experimental forest follows the boundary of that main branch of Hubbard Brook. There are a number of small gauged watersheds within that larger Hubbard Brook Valley. Um, and and uh, some of these have been subjected to experimental manipulations, primarily cutting experiments, but also a, a calcium, a whole watershed calcium addition. Um, there are um, a number of uh, places where we monitor climate. Uh, so we have a, a network of, of weather stations um, and there are other things being monitored at the site like soil, vegetation and animals. Um, the major uh, research theme at Hubbard Brook is ecosystem response to disturbances. And so this includes things like uh, forest harvesting, air pollution, and of course, today's topic, uh, which is climate change. Um, and it's clear that the climate is uh, changing at this site and, and really in this region. These are air temperature data from Mount Washington, Hanover, New Hampshire, and the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest. Um, this is expressed as an air temperature anomaly, so it's a deviation from the mean in uh, degrees Celsius. And we present it this way so you can compare these sites with very different temperatures on the same scale. Um, and you can see that at Hubbard Brook, the, the air temperature has increased um, since the 1950s. It's increased by about one and a half degrees Celsius over the 60 plus year time frame. Um, when people talk about climate change, uh, they often think more about air temperature and less about precipitation, but certainly precipitation is changing as well. Uh, this map is from the um, uh, National Climate Assessment, and uh, it shows precipitation change uh, from the first uh, part of the century to the latter, uh, a latter time period. And you can see that there's really been an increase in precipitation in the northeastern U.S., anywhere from you know, five up to greater than 15% increase. Um, and so, so we have uh, seen these increases in precipitation um, and the record at Hubbard Brook bears that out. This is the um, precipitation in, in gold at Hubbard Brook. 
And the, the purple here is from St. Johnsbury, Vermont, which again has a record that dates back to the late 1800s. You can see the precipitation kind of bounced along, you know, from the late 1800s up until about the middle of the 20th century. And then we've really been on this sharp increase uh, since that time. Um, at Hubbard Brook, uh, you know, right around when the record first uh, um, uh, started, the, the precipitation just kind of took off. And so, although there's a lot of variability from, from year to year, this increase is really quite dramatic. It, it's about a foot increase over this 60 plus year record. And so, you know, that's just really amazing when you think about it. Um, I'm not convinced we can attribute that all to uh, climate change, but, but clearly we are in a very wet cycle right now. We can also look at uh, seasonal trends in air temperature and precipitation. These are from four weather stations at Hubbard Brook. Um, and this is the slope of the trend line. So positive values indicate an increasing trend, negative values indicate a decreasing trend. And here the hatch marks just show the level of significance of the trend. And so in the top graph, if you look at air temperature, you can see we have, um, pretty consistent increases across all seasons um, and, and, and uh, highly significant increases in air temperature on an annual basis. For precipitation, we see very little change in fall, winter, and spring, maybe slight increases, but not much of a change. Um, really, the bulk of our precipitation increase has occurred during the summer months. And this is actually um, you know, the opposite of what most, primate, uh, most climate change projections are suggesting for the future. Most projections suggest we'll see more winter precipitation and little to no change in, in summer precipitation. Um, so I said we had warmer winter air temperatures and no change in winter pre uh, precipitation. So it's not surprising that our snowpack is declining. Again, this is really uh, occurring across the region and there's a lot of evidence for that. Um, at Hubbard Brook, we've measured uh, the snowpack the same way really since the inception of the study in the mid-1950s. Um, the top graph here just shows the maximum snow depth uh, for, on an annual basis, and it's declined by about uh, 20 centimeters, so again, by nearly a foot. Um, and the number of days of snow cover have also declined. We have about 19 fewer days of snow cover now as, as compared to when the record first began. Um, the changes in snowpack have also led to changes in stream flow. These are stream flow measurements from one of our reference watersheds, so it's relatively undisturbed. Um, and, uh, and, and here I'm just showing um, a stream flow for the present compared to, or, or at the end of the record compared to the beginning of the record. Um, and so it's, it's not actually the year 1969, it, it's the uh, beginning of the trend line and which started in 1969 uh, for this watershed. Um, and so, uh, you know, the overall pattern of stream flow at Harbor Brook is, and, and in most uh, of these streams in the region is that um, you tend to have higher flows during the, the fall and, and into early winter. Then we have low snows as that precipitation accumulates in the snowpack and then it's released over a very short snowmelt period in spring and then we have again low base flows and so in summertime when there's a lot of transpiration. Um, and so we're seeing this shift, uh, the snowmelt peak isn't as high as it used to be um, and it's also occurring earlier in the year and we tend to have higher flows as, as well um, in, in the early winter months. Okay, so far I've talked um, almost entirely about long-term trends, um, and I, I just want to make the point that um, extremes are, uh, are, are, are these extreme weather events are also important and, and can be even more important than these more subtle changes that occur over time. We have lots of evidence of these extreme events, uh, the occurrence of the events and, and how they've impacted the hydrology and, and uh, biogeochemistry of, of these systems and, and nutrient cycling in general. And these are uh, a list of, of some of the more uh, prominent kind of climate extremes or, or weather events that we've uh, seen um, at, at Hubbard Brook. Um, a good example is Tropical Storm Irene. I know uh, many of you uh, were affected by this in, in some way. It was uh, occurred in 2011. It was the 15th costliest uh, hurricane in U.S. history. 
at the time it happened, it was the seventh costliest. So clearly we've had a lot of these um, uh, big hurricanes in, in recent years. Uh, and it, it dropped up to 25 centimeters of, of rain in New Hampshire over a relatively short period, basically over a 24 hour period. Um, this event was not unprecedented. Uh, I love this picture in the lower right here. It's uh, on the side of a gas station in, in Plymouth, New Hampshire, and it shows the high water mark for Hurricane Irene um, and, and uh, the high water mark of other storms. And so there are at least two other storms, uh, you know, that were higher than, than the high water mark at, at uh, Hurricane Irene. Um, and so we do get these uh, events and, and they're quite uh, damaging and, and costly. Um, uh, in in a, one of the previous slides, I showed that uh, stream flow is uh, highest in, uh, during that snowmelt period, which is true on average, but we can get uh, flooding events any time throughout the year. Um, and so this is a graph showing the top 20 stream flow events at Hubbard Brook um, and when they occur. And we've also linked uh, the type of um, event uh, that uh, caused these high stream flows. And so, you know, you can see that in the winter months, we have rain on snow events that can be quite important. Um, uh, straight snowmelt events in, in the springtime. Uh, in the uh, summer, we get these convective rainfall uh, events that, that often cause flooding. Um, in some cases, hurricanes like Hurricane Irene is one of these uh, uh, um, points here. Um, and then in, in the fall and, and winter, we have these uh, frontal rainstorms where uh, warm air meets cold air. So any of these can, can cause flooding throughout the year. Um, we can analyze the occurrence of the high flow events to look at uh, how they've changed over time. Again, these are data from Harvard Brook and, and this shows the number of days when stream flow exceeds the 95th percentile. And so we're seeing an increase in the number of days with high flow. Uh, we can do the same kind of analysis with a low flow. This is the number of days per year with stream flow less than the fifth percentile. And so the number of low flow days are, are decreasing. Uh, we often, you know, associate a drought with a climate change and, and so, uh, you know, so far that really has not been the case. Um, we've seen an increase in base flow during summertime and that's largely because this of this precipitation increase that's uh, occurring over the summer months. Um, the, the trend in flooding is really um, Throughout the Northeast region, this is, map is a little dated now, but it shows uh, the trend in uh, flood frequency throughout the Northeast. This is on major rivers um, that have uh, at least 50 years of data, and these are minimally disturbed um, rivers, so they're not affected uh, much by human influences like water withdrawals and like that. Um, and, and so the blue triangles just represent an increase in flood frequency and the red triangles show decreases. And so, you know, most of these rivers are showing increases in the frequency of floods. Of course, these flooding events can have uh, massive impacts on infrastructure. This is an Im image from the Green Mountain National Forest. It shows the 100 year flood design level for this culvert. Um, and then it shows the peak during hurricane Irene, um, and you know, this particular culvert survived this storm, but many did not. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think it's, it, it just uh, brings home the point that uh, data from the past are really not reliable for making predictions for the future. And so if you have something like a culvert that you expect to last 50 years, we really have to consider uh, how uh, climate and precipitation might change over that long term. And so it's important to to design these structures with climate change in mind. In addition to um, flooding events um, affecting you know, infrastructure, they also can impact water quality um, and certainly sediment is, is uh, largely affected by these high flow events. Um, sediment can not only affect biota, but can also affect stream uh, morphology and, and can cause these stream channels to shift. Uh, and it, it's really these high flow events that produce the amount of sediment. At Hubbard Brook, we, we measure sediment in the Weir Basin, which is what this bottom image shows. And, and we have lots of evidence that shows um, that uh, most of the sediment movement occurs during these uh, really high stream flow events. 
In addition to sediment, um, we can also uh, uh, talk about nutrients in, in stream water and, and how they're affected by uh, climate. This graph shows the long-term record of nitrate in stream water in the reference watershed at Hubbard Brook. Um, of course, we're concerned about nitrogen because although it's often a, a growth limiting nutrient in forest, it can also be a, a pollutant in stream water. And so nitrogen is very important from a, a biological perspective. Um, and when the watershed is, is disturbed in some way, it often results in the release of nitrate to stream water. Um, and so you can see that there are a number of peaks in this long term record. Uh, I don't think we have a great handle on what's causing these peaks, but um, there's been uh, a, a lot of speculation on, on what might be driving each one. Uh, there is this period of extended uh, high nitrate export uh, during the late 1960s and early 1970s, and, and some have suggested that uh, uh, the, the pro, uh, prolonged drought of the 1960s that affected much of the Northeast uh, led to this increase in, in nitrate in stream water. Uh, there was another peak in 1998, which we think was, uh, uh, could be due to a, a major soil frost event that occurred. Again, this was a, a regional peak in, in nitrate that was observed at, at a number of small watersheds in the Northeast. Um, the one we are fairly confident in is, is the ice storm of 1998. Again, this was a, a major disturbance, above ground disturbance that caused this spike. Um, and then we, we had a recent spike in 2013 and we don't really understand what's driving this. This is the, the a topic of, of um, much uh, research, uh, current research right now. We're actively trying to figure out what caused this spike in 2013. And we think it might have been a combination of multiple climate related factors like phenology and uh, springtime temperatures and, and a number of other things that all kind of came together at the same time to, to produce this spike. And so, uh, so there's a lot of mysteries here. Uh, we've been trying to understand what, what's driving these and for each one of those spikes there have been experiments designed around them. Um, there's a series of soil freezing experiments um, where you know snow is removed off plots and uh, to let the soil freeze. Um, and so this is kind of a below ground experiment or below ground ex uh, um, disturbance that affects plant or, or vegetation and the roots and, and prevents them from taking up nitrogen. Um, Pam Templer uh, talked in the last webinar in, in this series, and um, I think she covered the soil warming and freeze-thaw experiment that she's been involved in. Uh, Heidi Asperson at the University of New Hampshire um, is leading a, a drought experiment where she set up these kind of uh, troughs and, and have sh uh, shunted water or precipitation off plots to look at impacts of droughts. And then lastly, we've had this ice storm experiment where we spray water above the forest canopy during freezing conditions um, to kind of simulate a glaze ice event. Uh, I don't have time to go into the, the results of these studies, um, but uh, it, it's not always, always a clear picture. And, and so, uh, but this has helped us try and understand some of the mechanisms that are driving these peaks in, in nitrogen and stream water. Okay, I wanna um, just end with a few slides about forest management and Im impacts for climate change and hydrology. In the Northeastern US, we don't typically manage forests specifically for water supply and quality. It's usually one of the considerations, but generally not the primary considerations. There are some exceptions to that, um, uh, such as maintaining watersheds for, for drinking water. This is a, a picture of the Quabbin Reservoir, which is the water supply for Boston, as you probably know. Um, and they put a great deal of thought into how best to manage the land around the Quabbin Reservoir to ensure that the supply of and quality of water is, is maintained even, even during the most extreme circumstances like this drought in the 1960s or, or the 1938 hurricane. Um, so, uh, so we don't typically manage uh, specifically for, for water quality, but it does raise questions about whether forest management uh, mitigates or exacerbates kind of climate change effects on water. Um, and at Hubbard Brook, there have been several cutting experiments that shed some light on this. Um, these graphs show the change in water yield following two different um, kind of experimental cuts. Uh, one was uh, a watershed that was cut and all the trees were left in place and then uh, it was sprayed with herbicide for three growing seasons. Um, the other one was a, a progressive strip cut where these 25 meter swaths were removed 
from the forest. So this was kind of like a gentler uh, type of, of treatment. Um, and in both cases, you see this increase in water yield in the years after the cut, um, but it's followed by a long period of a reduction in water yield. Um, and the reason for that is the first species to move in is pinchery, which has very high transpiration rates. And so it, um, it, it uh, uh, made uh, losses of water via transpiration. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, we typically don't manage uh, thinking about water uh, and, and um, you know, transpiration and that uh, because it's tricky to control over the landscape over a very long time period. And so this is not something we generally consider. Um, it does raise questions about how to manage forests for kind of climate change though. And, and I, you know, what everyone kind of wants is this invincible forest. And, and what I mean by that is, is one that can withstand that natural and human disturbances and recover very quickly. Um, and the way to do that is, is to uh, kind of hedge your bets by uh, you know maintaining the diversity of species and, and a, a, a diversity of age classes. This is generally things that people do in, in general because it's good for uh, management um, and, and can certainly enhance recovery after disturbance. Okay, so I will end there and I guess we'll sessions to the uh, to the end and I'll pass the reins over to Aaron. Great. Thank you so much, John. Yeah, so we'll let Erin take the take the floor uh, with her with her presentation. Um, we do have a question in the chat box, so other folks, please feel free to type your questions into the chat box. And once again, we will start addressing those uh, after Erin's presentation concludes. All right, here we go. Hi all. Um, so thanks for joining us today. And. All right, there we go. <laughs> um, so I'm Aaron Rogers. I am the project coordinator for Trout Unlimited, um, and I kind of cover the range throughout New England, um, doing everything from culvert assessment and design and replacement to the in-stream habitat and woody additions that I'll mostly be talking about today. Um, just to kind of give a, a state of streams in most of New England at the moment, um, you know, there have been a lot of historic land use changes and um, even recent forest and stream management that has left a lot of streams very straight uh, and very much down cut. Um, this has a lot of repercussions that I'll uh, get into more and more over time, but basically, um, you know, a lot of our, a lot of historic land use changes have, you know, have all been towards keeping water in streams and very much within those streams um, to the point of even building up berms, uh, larger banks, and kind of shuttling water as fast as we can onto somebody else's property. Um, as John's uh, presentations were saying, you know, the peak flows and average flows um, or peak rainfall events, uh, average rainfall events, which obviously lead to peak flows, um, have really been increasing over time. And projecting out into the future, uh, some modeling that has been done recently by both Richard Palmer, Keith Nislow, and many others, uh, has, been, uh, has been showing that, you know, it could be up to a 13% increase in peak flows by mid-century and up to a 50% increase in mid-flows by the end of century, which is a lot of water to account for uh, spatially. Um, the variation in frequency and intensity has really been changing as a lot of John's graphs showed, um, not just higher highs, but lower lows between those, um, warmer winters and warmer summers with increased potential for drought between these high flow events. So things that I have to end up paying attention to both sides of that um, when I'm looking at fisheries. Um, and really what that again means for not just streams, but for the riparian forests surrounding them as well. Um, so stream channelization, most people don't really think of it terribly much, um, but really a straightened stream is a shorter stream and covering the same amount or covering less distance down the side of a mountain or down the landscape um, but still covering that same elevation drop means that we're also seeing a lot steeper streams. Um, the flow is 
you know, very much impacted by this nice shooting shuttle of water coming down the mountainside. Um, but also when you're talking about shorter streams, uh, you're also changing the volumetric capacity of those streams as well. So a longer stream, you can store more water in it over that same distance than you can this shorter stream that now exists there. Um, and that kind of shown through this graphic that uh, I stole from another paper. <laughs> um, you know, you've got the, the more sinuous channel doesn't nearly flood out quite as wide as, you know, a channel that has been um, straightened and run straight through a town, both from, you know, the lack of or the changes in porosity from the surrounding landscape, but also just because you can't fit nearly as much water in that channel as you once could when it had that sinuosity built into it. Um, another wonderful graphic stealing from another uh, group from the Northeast Climate Ad Adaptation Science Center out of UMass or out of Amherst. Um, getting to some of these points in a very nice, simple, nice, simple infographic um, that's really highlighting their work to to find ways to slow the flow so that, you know, finding alternate ways of storing water in those upstream forested watersheds before they really are able to impact the uh, human communities on the downstream end. Um, with the increase in floods, uh, increase in peak flows, um, it has that water has more capacity to move larger objects out of the stream channel. So it's pushing the large wood out, it's pushing the large boulders out. Um, and people are having a really good time uh, helping that along as well. So without, um, you know, objects without structure in the water, there's really nothing to catch the sediment and it cuts down in the channel. Um, so if we started off historically 150 years ago in the kind of stage one stable condition, you know, over time channeling uh, more flows, higher velocities, um, we work more and more into the kind of stage two incision. So stream channels are cutting down as sediment is being worn away. Um, that leads to instability and the banks start to fail. Uh, streams get very wide, streams get very shallow. Um, it starts to stabilize a little bit after that and basically hits a secondary stage five stable condition, um, but at a substantially lower elevation than previously. So most of New England is pretty much in a stage two and stage three um, through most of, of, of our streams, especially our headwater streams. Um, and you can see that in, you know, if you, if you dress, drive along the roads, a lot of things you'll see through there. Um, and again, with little to no roughness in the stream, there's not a lot to slow water flow down. Um, and that kind of leaves us with uh, a bit of a negative feedback loop that's just increased by or exacerbated by that increased precipitation that we've been seeing across New England and across a lot of the northern tier of the states. Um, higher flows, more erosion uh, through the stream bed, um, you get more incision, more widening, and it just creates that same process over and over again. Um, and this is also relevant to drought conditions. So when you have an incised stream channel, it lowers that kind of baseline groundwater condition. Um, so again, the historic stage one, you've got a higher groundwater table as it cuts down um, through incision and through widening, um, your, uh, your groundwater table, both at the stream level and in the surrounding riparian forest, has been cut down, you know, two to three times, depending on the severity of the incision. Um, and that really leads to um, how we can reconnect the forest systems and the stream systems. Um, I feel like there's been a lot of years that they've kind of been separated in terms of theory and practice and um, we're kind of just now kind of coming back into how we can reconnect these things. Um, so this is a, a, a chart from Warren's paper back in 2007. Um, so looking at the age of the forest stand versus the volume of large woody material in the stream channel. Obviously young forest, there's very little um, 
in stream wood in the channel. And as you get older and start to get into those old growth forests, um, the amount of wood in the stream channel really starts to increase. Um, other modeling done by Keith Nislo uh, has shown that, or has um, kind of been modeled out to optimally in old growth forests and mature forests, you would see anywhere from 270 to 320 pieces of large wood in a stream uh, per mile. And uh, by most counts, even through, you know, protected lands, national oh, forest lands, uh, we're seeing on average maybe 10 to 20 pieces of mile of, of large stream per mile, of large wood in the stream per mile. So um, there is, there's a big gap in what we are seeing currently with what could be there in a healthy stream system and stream and riparian system. Um, increasing the large wood in streams can mitigate a lot of the effects of climate-induced hydrologic challenges. So it's helping to keep the sediment in the stream channel, um, protecting banks from erosion. It helps to, you know, push that flood water back out into the forested floodplain. Um, it increases the channel roughness, it slows the flood water down, and creates hydraulic velocity barriers. Um, and even over time, just during normal conditions, it's been shown to help increase nutrient cycling. So those problems that we're seeing with nitrogen, with phosphorus and different water bodies. Um, not that this is a 100% cure-all, but it can certainly be a piece in the larger puzzle. Uh, and it's really good idea to pair these kinds of in-stream large wood projects with upgrades to uh, road stream crossing infrastructure. Just like to note that in the picture here, that was not caused by any kind of large in-stream wood addition. Uh, that was actually from um, a picture in Western Massachusetts after Hurricane Irene. So this is just stuff that was coming off the landscape anyway. Um, but what I have found through a lot of my culvert work is that in any given watershed, subwatershed, um, roughly half of all road stream crossings are either moderately to severely undersized for the stream channel that is flowing through them. Um, the cost of doing, of doing these upgrades is pretty substantial. Um, if you're working with town and state roads, uh, you can get away with a lot more flexibility if you're working on forest roads, harvest roads, especially if it's temporary bridges that you can then take out and use somewhere else for another year. Um, and in kind of the large woodwork, um, this is why we use a lot of what are called strainer trees before we get anywhere near infrastructure. Um, and the importance of securing a lot of the trees in kind of the different ways that we use um, methods based on the size of the streams that we're working in. Um, so again, some of the key considerations that we're looking at when we're implementing this, being a fisheries person for Trout Unlimited, um, I'm really looking to maximize habitat diversity, both in normal flow, low flow conditions, and kind of keeping things in, uh, in place during those high flow conditions as well. When we're working in any given place, we're aiming to, you know, we're not opening up the canopy cover any more than 20%, and that's, you know, at a at a maximum. Usually it's a lot less than that. Um, the kind of works that I'll be showing um, in the next few slides work very well, particularly mixed age forest stands. That way when we're using some of the mature trees to, you know, put into the stream channel, there are those younger and middle-aged trees um, that can easily and pretty quickly fill in those gaps. Um, we always leave bank trees and standing dead trees because they're wonderful bat and bird habitat. Um, and more and more lately over the last few years, we have been um, taking diseased trees and otherwise vulnerable trees. So starting last summer, we've been taking a lot more of the white ash um, in anticipation of the emerald ash borer that's been you know, making its way up through Vermont and the rest of New England. Um, and we also utilize pinch points and natural bends in the river, um, finding ways that we can help emphasize those areas um, and using those standing bank trees to help secure wood in place so that it's not becoming a risk to downstream infrastructure, to downstream landowners. Um, and so just a few examples of some of these things. Um, back in 2015, we were doing some of this work and it was, that was one of the 
pretty substantial drought years, um, such that we were working in a lot of channels that didn't have water flowing in them at the moment. So it was a bit of a guessing game as to wood placement. Um, but you can see here from a project site in Jeffrey, New Hampshire, um, what this um, kind of smaller installation has been able to produce on the other side in terms of pushing water out to the edges um, and kind of creating more of a, a braided channel, more of a little bit uh, of a floodplain access through here. Um, another site from Jaffrey, again, a nice straight, very wide channel. Um, and then the following summer, um, so that's just all material that once water did start flowing through the system again um, and through the fall collecting small woody matter and, um, and leaf litter kind of fills in those gaps and brought the, the stream channel basically right up to its banks instead of where we can see the more incised channel on the downstream end still. Uh, and it's not always pretty, uh, especially on the bigger streams um, right after installation, but really quickly the, um, the stream really integrates any large wood that we add into it um, very quickly. <laughs> uh, you can see where these larger uh, hemlock and trees have you know, they've lost their bottom branches, they're sitting farther into the bottom, and the difference between the water flow upstream of the installation to the water flow downstream of the installation, um, it, it's significantly reduced. It's also obviously pushed out, it's beyond the banks here, um, kind of spreading that flow and mitigating the, the effects. Um, John had talked about rain on snow events and how those, there's a good chance that those are gonna become more and more likely. Um, this is exactly um, an example of that from Deerfield, New Hampshire, out towards the seacoast, um, where we had done several installations. And I think this was the winter or late spring of 2016 on a couple of tributaries to the Lamprey River. Um, and you can see where these installations already are pushing way outside of the banks um, and kind of, again, creating those nice step pools, creating the, um, the area available for overflow. Um, one of the further upstream or one of the further downstream sites here, uh, an installation of three or four pretty substantial sized trees are fully submerged in the river and, you know, again, pushing out, um, helping slow that flow down, creating those, um, that hydraulic disruption. Um, and then in this one, uh, further downstream where it uh, starts to get to be a pretty substantially sized river, this log jam here has created a, a massive overflow channel out through the forest um, to, uh, to river left here. So the main part of the channel, um, the original banks kind of cut this way and the water in the channel at this point is about three or four feet deep. Um, but there's this, you know, fairly large swath cutting down around and through the forest. Um, and as winter rain on snow events become more and more common, or rain on snow events become more and more common and ice jams and ice damming becomes a problem. Um, so this was at a site in, the Green Mountain National Forest where, you know, this was less than a year after installation and um, wound up having a very severe winter and a very severe spring where several um, of the smaller installations ended up kind of amassing into one very large log jam, um, which luckily with the Green Mountain National Forest, we have the flexibility and the latitude to have really big messy jams like this. Not every landowner um, would, would, you know, find this nearly as acceptable as the Forest Service does, but they were, they were pretty pleased by it. Um, and one of the things to really pay attention to in these two shots, this is the same jam um, kind of looking upstream and then looking from the downstream towards the jam. Um, it degraded cobble and gravel um, several inches on the upstream side of this. So, between the upstream and the downstream of at this log jam, uh, there is about a foot and a half of difference. Um, and the scour pool that's formed on the downstream end uh, is four or more feet deep right there. 
um, which is incredible habitat for a lot of cold water species. As we're talking about warmer winters and warmer summers, you know, in streams that are less groundwater influenced and more influenced by the air temperatures surrounding, uh, having that those nice deep pools as cold water refugia for um, for our cold water species is incredibly important. And um, these kinds of large wood structures are actually a lot more porous than they look. Um, yes, there are several feet difference between you know stream bed upstream and stream bed downstream, but that's still very much a passable structure if you're a fish. Uh, so really what we're doing with this kind of work is bringing it from the kind of more incised uh, stage five stable condition back up to uh, a more graded stage one stable condition. So trying to bring these stream beds and stream channels back up um, to have that easier access to floodplains, to have that easier access out to the riparian forest. Um, it increases that, that floodplain spread, it increases braiding in a lot of places, um, and it helps kind of raise that groundwater condition back up as well so that hopefully during those times of drought that we do see um, that there will be less um, forest stress on those trees if the groundwater table is a little bit more easily accessible there. Um, and it also improves natural wood recruitment. This is a lot of kind of adding the large in-stream wood uh, is just kind of re-kickstarting that process. So we don't expect it to be stable forever, um, but we do expect it to be able to be replaced by the natural pieces of large wood otherwise coming into the stream. Um, and when we're doing this kind of work, there are plenty of other forest and river hydrologic interactions that not being a forester, um, I always kind of think about, but never really have the, you know, capacity to study, <laughs> I guess. Um, so, I mean, looking at all of the literature, you know, there are going to be changes in forest types and um, that we're going to lose certain types of trees entirely. So that slow death, slow death and loss of adult trees, um, you know, leading to changes in transportation and groundwater influence. Um, it also means that there's going to be a lot more natural recruitment like those uh, wood seen in the picture here. Um, and then after that, there's going to be that sudden increase in, in young saplings, um, whether that increases groundwater uptake, especially if it depends on which species are coming up next, whether it's, um, I mean, I probably don't work in a whole lot of areas where pin cherry is terribly common, but, you know, the thickets of beech stand that are coming up, I can't imagine <laughs> are not influencing the, uh, the surrounding stream. So lots of things to think about as temperatures change, as forest stands change, um, disease and pests come in and interact well with all of this. Um, so kind of the, the larger take, take home of all this is really looking back to that ecosystem linkage of um, the hydrology, the, the forests and the streams kind of, um, you know, we're working to put the forest back in the streams so that the stream can come back out into the forest as well. And that creates healthier and more resilient systems on both sides of the equations. Um, potentially restoring riparian floodplain forests that have been diminishing in recent years. Um, it also helps to store a lot of this flood water higher in the watershed and reduces that impact to downstream communities. Um, so yeah, that's about it for me. I've seen the chat box popping up pretty regularly. So I'm assuming there are questions to be had. Great, thank you so much, Erin. Um, yeah, we have had some great questions come in and thank you both uh, John and Erin for your presentation. Um, we have questions that are for both of you. I've tried to organize it a little bit. Um, first, um, for the good of the recording, I wanna highlight uh, James Schmierer had a question which Maria answered with a publication. Uh, uh, Jim asked, has the cost of upgrades and improvements for forest road and trail infrastructure to accommodate these higher peak flows and extreme hydrologic events been determined and documented? Um, and in the chat box, uh, Maria shared a, a link um, to a publication that might help answer some of those questions. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna move on. Um, I know our speakers may have something to say about that, but um, let's see if we can move on for the moment. 
Um, another question that was answered, um, Dominique asks, what is the species high, with high transpiration rate that regrows after disturbance? And pin cherry, Prunus pepelbanica, was the response. So um, Jenna Masters wrote, wrote in from Hawaii, and she says, uh, we've been doing a lot of cutting of non-native trees known to be super soakers of water. Is it possible that we are releasing more water into the area? It is one of my theories as to why some of our reintroductions are doing so well. And Tim chimed in, as an irony of the Southwest, we've been removing uh, ferrocytes to increase stream flows and raise water tables to good effect. Most are invasive. So John might have something to say about that, the cutting of non-native trees, and what does that do to the water table? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is a kind of an interesting comparison between the two sites. And, you know, the species that comes to mind for me is uh, tamarisk in the western U.S., which people have been trying to, to remove for, for years now. Um, and, you know, it just has really high uh, rates of transpiration and, and can uh, have a big impact on, on flows. Um, and so this is kind of an interesting example in Hawaii that I wasn't aware of, but it's, it's a, a neat example and, and comparison. Great, thank you. Um, uh, when we were talking about, uh, well, I think this is during Aaron's presentation, uh, Jim had another question, comment. He says, Michigan's current BMP guidance prohibits us from depositing large top trees and logs into streams, even where it would be beneficial. Theoretically, we could attempt to get permits for such restoration, but any deposition is now considered a violation. In larger navigable streams, we also run up against opposition by some recreationists who prefer clear runs and few obstacles. And Tim says, same story at West. Uh, Aaron, <laughs> would you like to respond to that comment? Yeah, um, I mean, definitely what we do. So in terms of forestry BMPs through all the states that we work in, they definitely follow the same regulations, you know, no slash, no treetops and streams, things like that. Um, but when it is permitted under a, um, as a ecological restoration permit, and especially um, when, you follow certain guidelines, and especially like MRCS and others are becoming more aware of this as a practice and are integrating it more and more into forest management plans even, so that private landowners can work with their foresters to actually take these on. And it's been a bit of a slow process. It's definitely been a conversation with a lot of the state agencies to kind of show them the benefits um, in, in small doses and kind of figure out the permitting process um, a little bit slowly, um, but everybody in New England is really on board with it nowadays. And um, yeah, so it's, it's, it is definitely a different permitting process than what I think a lot of forest managers and forest harvest operations have to go through. Um, but that's kind of the next step that I've been working with with some of our state agencies is kind of how how that can be done together in a responsible way that um, that bad actors won't be able to take advantage of while good actors can really you know kind of do best works for um, it, thank you streams we've actually run into that as well and we've actually gone in and done partial cuts to remove um, like half a stream width uh, so that there is always a way around some of the larger log jams um, without causing, you know, too much of a risk for paddlers. Got it, thank you. Um, speaking of how do you get trees into streams, uh, we had a few comments. Uh, Karen Bennett said, why don't we leave some ash and other diseased trees to fall in the streams? And we also had a question about uh, reintroducing beavers <laughs> um, as they are in the West. And uh, Maria replied that many people in the Northeast will comment that beavers are reintroducing themselves. <laughs> I don't know if you have a comment on more natural uh, ways or opportunities to get uh, trees into streams. Uh, yeah, and I mean, that's why we definitely leave standing dead. Um, we know that they're going to make their way in there eventually. And we don't take all of the ash. We know that, um, or in hemlock woolly adelgid areas, we don't take all of the hemlocks. Um, we're still kind of maintaining those generally, you know, not more than four or five trees in an area of an installation. Um, so that, yes, there is still a lot left over that will naturally recruit over time, um, depending on how quickly disease moves through, what kind of rates of, of decay um, around the base. And um, so, yeah, in terms of the beaver, <laughs> 
Yeah, there's still a lot of folks who don't want to see beaver in a lot of areas. Um, I think they do a lot of wonderful things for a landscape, and there are actually a lot of people who have been looking into doing beaver dam analogs, um, which is basically human-built beaver dams uh, where beavers do not exist. Um, and that's had some really good results too um, for, for areas where people don't necessarily want the beaver, but they still want the ecological restoration. Cool, thank you. We're getting some really awesome questions into the group chat. Um, so just for a quick time out, um, I think our speakers are able to stay on a few minutes after the top of the hour. So I think we'll keep questions going as long as, <laughs> as, long as they, they come. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we'll go back and I will pause just before the top of the hour to make sure we get good information out. Um, we had another question that came into the chat box uh, from Adam um, who asked, would maintaining higher volumes of woody debris during average and slow flow conditions mitigate the impact of wood moving during peak relevance, i.e. by slowing flow and reducing the volume of wood moving downstream during those uh, and the damage to infrastructure? Uh, sorry, would, yeah. Um, would, would, sorry. By slowing flow and reducing the volume of wood moving downstream during those and the damage to infrastructure, Perhaps the peak flows overwhelm any slowing effect of the larger wood and thus have the opposite effect, i.e. more wood damaging infrastructure. Maybe there's a short versus long-term trade-off here as well. Yeah, it's hard. I feel like to quantify that at this point. I mean, we've seen enough wood moving off the landscape in systems that don't have any wood naturally occurring or much natural wood occurring in streams um, and still damaging infrastructure during those high storm events that um, we don't typically, I mean, so we, we do take a lot of measures to make sure that there's going to be as little mobile wood during most flow events. Um, so we have ways of securing things by natural means um, without bringing cabling or other things into the mix. Um, perhaps the peak flows over one of the slowing effect. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's already plenty of wood damaging infrastructure <laughs> in terms of short to versus long-term trade-offs. And I mean, I kind of hate to say, but there are a lot of towns that replacing infrastructure has gotten to be expensive enough that they're actually waiting for it to fail so that they can replace it more easily <laughs> without having to pay for the removal because the stream just did it for them. Um, and I mean, I, I certainly don't want to advocate that as, you know, as a route that anybody should be taking because there's a lot more damage done during, you know, those emergency replacements than, than good most of the time. So yeah, it's definitely a short versus long-term trade-off and um, but I feel like anything that can, can mitigate these large storm events high up in the watershed where there is a lot less infrastructure to be at risk is going to be a benefit for, for most communities. Got it. Thank you. Um, I'll see if we can get John a chance to answer a question. Nicole just asked, uh, do you have any downstream water quality data that shows improvement in turbidity or other water, water quality parameters post-ecological restoration efforts? Uh, yeah, so I'm a little confused by the question. So that is, uh, like, um, well downstream. Um, so yes, yeah, so I, I think that's more of a question for Aaron, right? Um, in, in terms of the restoration with woody debris at, at Hubbard Brook, okay. um, we, we don't really do restoration so much. We've had these cutting experiments and all those are done, you know, at, at, at the watershed scale. Um, and so we monitor the chemistry and have a, an understanding of the impact, um, but, but we don't do much in terms of water quality improvements. So maybe that's a better question for Aaron. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so there has been a few studies that are still kind of in their preliminary stages as far as I know. Um, there was one that we were working specifically with um, the University of New Hampshire Water Center and a few of their grad students um, who were doing nitrogen monitoring at several of our locations. Um, initial results have shown that it certainly does help in nitrogen reduction kind of at a 
much larger reach scale within the river. Um, but I don't think anything has been published out of that yet, so. Okay, so good question. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take a quick time out here, and uh, <laughs> there are so many questions. We're going to have to keep going, but I know that a lot of people might need to jump off at this time. Um, so we will keep going, but please join me in a virtual thank you to our, our presenters. This has been a really, really active and engaging webinar, um, so thank you. Um, I also want to point out that I did put in the chat box a link to the SAS CFE certificate. Um, so it's a certificate of credit assignment. And if you didn't get the link, I can email it to you later. Just uh, let me know if you need it. Um, and I will be recording, uh, reporting the participant list to SAF for anybody who is seeking credit. But if you need the certificate for your own records, um, then we'll have that available. Um, with that, we're going to dive back into questions. Uh, thanks again to Aaron and John for sticking with us because we've got some really good ones in here. Oh, where to begin? Where to begin? Um, Nancy Patch had a really good question. Um, she says, I'm wondering about the management of our woods road infrastructure outside of the riparian area. Historical road work dishes and drains disrupting the natural sheeting and hydrologic flow resulting in concentrated flow. Should we be designing our roads differently? Maybe more outlets and angled roads like the old dozer roads? Either of you could take that. I mean, that's a little tricky. I'm not an engineer, but, you know, I, I think there is probably, you know, more care that could be taken and, and thought put into some of these road networks and how they're uh, constructed, especially in, in some of these forested areas. Um, BMPs do cover a lot of that. Um, and so, uh, but, but certainly I think there's probably more that, that could be done there. I mean, I've been working with a few towns um, just in terms of their you know, Vermont has a lot of dirt roads, um, Western Mass, uh, New Hampshire, all of those areas. Um, and, you know, they run into a lot of the same problems in terms of, you know, what works in terms of flow and drainage and what is just, which roads are continually washing into the stream no matter what they do. Um, so that's, that's definitely an ongoing conversation, an ongoing project that people are still trying to find solutions to. Um, not being nearly as well versed in logging roads and their construction. I can't answer as much to that one though. Sounds like a good research project with my, which might tie us to our next question. Uh, Steve, Steven has asked, uh, has Hubbardbrook considered implementing Trout Unlimited wood installations on a subset of their study area and then analyze the hydrologic effects to that stream? A good collaborative opportunity here possibly? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Um, so at Harbor Brook, there's been a long history of doing uh, wood additions and removals and debris dam additions and removals. Um, and uh, the Hubbard Brook streams, a lot of them are a first and second order streams. And, and so that, uh, the focus of that was not so much on fish as it was on more biogeochemistry. Um, most recently, Bill Keaton at the University of Vermont has a proposal that's um, uh, funded uh, to um, do uh, some of this work and, and look at the role of, of woody debris in streams and, and he's trying to uh, figure out methods. It's still in kind of a design phase now, but this is something we're gonna be actively working on. Um, people who fish at Hubbard Brook are often go away very disappointed because there aren't a lot of fish um, just because it's, it's um, uh, kind of difficult terrain and, and these real um, you know, low order, you know, first and second order streams. Um, and so we don't have a lot of fish, but there are some bro brook trout and, and a few other uh, species. Cool. Aaron, did you want to add to that or you good for now? Um, yeah, no, I mean, I'm happy to collaborate with nearly anyone who has land to kind of implement this work and especially who has the capacity to um, really dig deeper into some of the effects that this is having on the landscape scale. Um, in terms of benefits to fisher fisheries and particularly to recreational fishers, um, we do get some complaints that, you know, the messy nature of this work, especially early on, puts off a lot of people. Um, but, you know, over a, over a series of years, um, several studies by Judd Kratzer up in um, Northern Vermont, who does similar work to this, um, he's found, you know, 300% increases in the size and abundance of brook trout in the streams where, you know, these restoration techniques have been put in. Um, so it definitely helps on the longer run, but you just have to be a better fisherman to do it. <laughs> All right. 
Um, speaking of fish, someone asked, how did trout get past the log jams? <laughs> uh, they are actually a lot more pervy, uh, you know, uh, permeable than they look. Um, it's not easy for a human to get through, but when you are, you know, a fish that is just a few inches long, um, it's a lot easier for sure. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Uh, Jim had a question. He says, I, want, I would be interested if we might have success simply girdling a few bigger, low, lower quality trees within the riparian zone. Uh, yep. So I actually work with a few land trusts. And when we were first piloting some of this work and how we could integrate it into um, private landowners' forestry management plans through the land trust, that was one of the first steps that they actually started taking um, before the before the cutting in stream wood really kind of took off was, you know, girdling trees, kind of setting up that, that, you know, standing dead tree to eventually, you know, A, become good habitat for a range of things and then to eventually fall into the stream as well. Um, it's definitely a longer range goal, but forestry management plans usually are. Um, and so I'm, I'm certainly supportive of that. It's also a think. consideration though too, right? I mean, that's something you, you don't have any control over when it will fall. And so you don't want to be doing that in, in areas where there are people regularly. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll try to get a couple more questions in. Uh, Tim asks, in addition to cutting experiments, are you using prescribed fire for forest and watershed health? I don't because I am not a forest per or a, a fire person. <laughs> I don't That's know if okay. it's done anything that way. Yeah, so we haven't done much with fire. It's a hard sell um, in the Northeast. Um, and so even though we do have occasional fires, um, it's, it hasn't been a high research priority. I've personally tried to get things funded to uh, look at fire and have failed miserably. Um, and so it hasn't become a high research priority. It's not to say it won't be in the future, but right now it's, it's really hard to get that kind of work funded. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, we do have a North Atlantic Fire Science Exchange and maybe we should chat more offline, John. Um, it would be fun to look at questions like that. But yeah, prescribed fire is not as common here as it is out West, but it does still happen. And uh, so maybe there's some possibilities there. Um, the last question, Dominique asks, uh, in 2006, a major rain on snow event at Mount Rainier caused, created tremendous flooding in the park. Streams in the park now have enough sediments from glacier melt that water level and road level are even thus mega flooding always possible. Um, the park was closed for six months then, but staff and engineers restored the entire road system at the exact same place. Any advice about more long-term vision for restoration after the next major flood event? I think this sort of thing happens a lot. Um, I think it happened on the White Mountain National Forest after Hurricane Irene, where many of the culverts they replaced, they replaced with culverts of the same size because that's what they were budgeted for. And, um, and so I, you know, I, I, I have been trying to make this case and I think a lot of people are realizing how important it is to really think about the future, as I said in, in, in my presentation, um, when kind of designing these things. It's not what's uh, you know, happening now, it's what could happen over the next 50 or 100 years, and it's so important when infrastructure uh, is designed to last for a long period. Yeah, and I mean, the whole stream and road flooding all the time is, is a regular occurrence, I think, throughout New England. I mean, a lot of the roads were always built in floodplains because it was the easy, flat place to build them historically, and then it's easier to build where roads were than to move them entirely to somebody else's land. Um, in terms of long-term visioning for, you know, how to help improve that, um, I think we actually just have to start designing roads to be flooded. If we're not going to move them out of the way, then we have to anticipate that that is going to be the reality. And if there are other ways to design roads and especially road fill and water conveyance systems to account for that flooding, then that would kind of be the next most logical solution. Um, it's, it's certainly a problem that we come up with or that we see all over the place. Um, yeah, White Mountain National Forest, Green Mountain National Forest, all the surrounding towns. I mean, after Irene, there were entire communities that didn't have a single road left out of their town because they had all been washed away. Um, so it's, it's definitely a 
a problem that at least as far as I know is not getting a lot of attention and really needs to be rethought in a different way than just, well, we'll just keep rebuilding the same road in the same place because that's where it's always been. Thank you. So, uh, um, great. And yeah, thank you for, uh, for sticking around for everybody. Uh, we stuck around for the Q and A. I think I've gotten most of the questions addressed. Um, and again, I think our uh, presenters are, are happy to share their contact info if you have additional questions. Um, but please, if you're still on the line, please join me in a virtual round of applause and thank you for our presenters. Uh, really, really great presentation, really great questions and discussion. Um, thanks everybody for taking time out of your day to think about changing hydrology and forest climate adaptation. Thank you. <laughs>